Okay, uh, I'll start by, it says Inca there in the corner. That's the company I work for. Uh, IKEA is a huge company and it's split up into several sub parts where Inca Group is the one that has all the stores in, for example, Sweden, Denmark, uh, total 30 countries, not all countries globally. There are some uh, countries that have uh, our own companies, but it's 160,000 employees. It's a really big organization. Um, and IKEA and Inca is uh, uh, just starting a transformation. Uh, it used to be a lot of outsourcing, and now uh, there has been a realization that that doesn't work so well. So we're bringing a lot of the work uh, back home to develop it in-house. Uh, so this is a little bit of the reflections from uh, a project that I joined um, at the first weeks uh, that we had there. So it will be a short intro to what DevOps is. There are a lot of different definitions. I'm not sure uh, which one you've heard or are using. So I'll go through that. Uh, a little bit of how we got started uh, on DevOps uh, in, in the project I'm sitting in right now. Then how we, how we and how you can continue the journey, uh, what to do next after you uh, do these first steps. And finally, uh, just uh, some further resources that you can use. So short introduction. Uh, there are a lot of de uh, definitions of DevOps. Uh, this is one that I think is quite good. It's a combination of cultural mindset, practices, and tools that increase the ability to deliver applications and services at high velocity. And it's, this definition is a bit different from what you see sometimes. It's like sometimes you talk about having development and uh, operations in the same team. And that is a way of, or one way to achieve this. But the important thing is that you have uh, the same goals. So it should not be that development have their goals and operations have different goals. That is the recipe for getting a lot of extra work. Uh, so you need to have this mindset in the uh, organization that you should be able to deliver things and services as fast as possible. And that way you're more competitive in the market. So that is uh, the goal that you're trying to achieve. And a lot of people do that by putting development and operations in, uh, in the same team, but it's not really necessary. Uh, the critical thing is that you have the same goal. Uh, in uh, IKEA at the moment, we are sitting in the same team. We have small teams that are responsible for everything from development uh, and then running it um, most of the time uh, in Google Cloud. So there has been some research on DevOps uh, the last few years. Uh, how many of you have read the State of DevOps report? One, two, yeah. Uh, and it's report they've done this uh, for, I think this is the fourth year they did it. So they've investigated what things in teams uh, increase the productivity uh, or end result. So they've done this report four years and they put together a book. Um, about it, and they find some really clear uh, connections between some of the behaviors that you do in your development teams and actually what the end results are. Uh, some things that is talked about a lot is continuous deploy. If you deploy fast, does that uh, make things worse or better? Um, but they have interviewed, I think it's 25,000 companies and uh, they've done a lot of statistics. The book is really good. They have a chapter on the statistics and al analysis they did that is very solid but boring. You can skip that one uh, unless you really want to get down into the nitty-gritty details. Uh, but it shows that what things really help out uh, in getting good performance from your teams. So they measured uh, a bit four basic things that uh, are really the targets to get good performance. One is Lead time, and what they do to measure it in an easy way is from when you've committed your code, uh, your pull request is merged, to when is in production. So from when you're done as a developer, when do you see this running on your website or whatever it might be? Second one is deployment frequency. How often do you deploy your applications? Is it once a month, once every two weeks, a few times a week, or several times a day? Um, and that's also something that's quite easy to measure. Uh, and it turns out the more often you deploy, the uh, higher uh, quality you will have to have. And the reason is if you deploy often, uh, you have to fix all those things that sometimes go wrong in deployment. You have to start automating things. You have to 
get all that in place. Uh, if you deploy every few months or half uh, once every or twice a year, then it almost always is difficult uh, because you don't force yourself to uh, to get rid of that. Then they also measure how often things fail. If you deploy, do you have to roll back or do emergency things? Uh, and the final measurement is time to restore when things fail, because they always fail um, a few of the times. How long time does it take for you to get back to full speed? And if you can get these things in place, you're quite good from a development uh, perspective. Um, you can get things out to customer fast. You can fix when go wrong. It doesn't go wrong that often. So these are the things you would like to uh, achieve. So what we did in <clears throat> IKEA was set up uh, uh, the IKEA uh, DevOps model. Everybody needs their own model. So we had uh, one that's quite similar to all others. Um, but it starts at the top. You define what you want to do. You design code, build, test, deploy it, release it, monitor, and support. And then sometimes you have to fix. And what we're trying to do is get to do this thing as often as we can. Um, preferably, this wheel should be done a few times every week um, for a team. Uh, and it's the product team that has the full responsibility for all the different steps in here. So it's not someone else. Uh, we don't have a central organization that does deployments or so on. It's, it's the team. Um, so everything is done in the team. And they're trying to do this and get them to do this as uh, often as possible. And with some teams that were not there, I mean, it's, uh, some teams do this every few weeks uh, or months. Uh, so we're not there in all places, but we're trying to achieve this, these fast cycles uh, where the team is responsible for everything. So getting started. Uh, when we started uh, this project, uh, we had first a few weeks before we had the organization in place, uh, we decided to use Scrum, but we didn't have a Scrum Master. He was coming in two weeks later. A um, lot of this organization thing. So we had some things ongoing for unstructured work for a couple of weeks. But then we had our first sprint, and we were ambitious. Uh, in our first two weeks, we wanted to have something in production. Um, we thought it was a bit of a crazy goal. Um, so we had to do feature development, one feature, uh, smallest thing that we could build. Then we needed some kind of build pipeline. We need to build this in a, a repetitive or consistent way. And we need some infrastructure in place too, something that this should run on. So this was what we set out to do. Uh, the feature development was actually the part that had been done the furthest before, partially because it was uh, some, a previous project that started on this that then got canceled, uh, that we took over some of their code. So the, we said, we'll do this in two weeks. So automated build, and that was the previous presentation. Um, as we heard triggered by pull, well, we have for pull requests and updates of pull requests is when we what we trigger on. Uh, Merge to master is also something we use specifically. And initially, we did this just for our test environment. And then uh, if we wanted to get our, our uh, integration and production environment, we did that manually. So first iteration, something. Uh, automated. And cloud build is something we use as well. Uh, what we have in uh, or are using IKEA, we're using GitHub Enterprise, so it's on-premise GitHub uh, with all the drawbacks of that. But there is an application called Briga that uh, when you get one of these uh, merge requests or pull requests, it takes uh, or sends to cloud build uh, a Git uh, token so it can pull out the source code and they can build there. So that's uh, something that we were able to use. So when code is committed, it's sent to Cloud Build. Um, what we do is we build, store some artifact in Artifactory, uh, basically a jar file, uh, something that we can deploy to different places then. And then we also deploy the, our functionality to Dataflow, which is the central technology in, in our technology stack. What Cloud Build is, is doing automatically is publish uh, results to uh, Cloud PubSub um, channel, if you want to. So we set up a Cloud function as well that then publishes uh, messages to Slack, so you can get uh, continuous notifications. 
And to be honest, that was actually in the second sprint that we got that to work a day or two in. But I added it here as well. Well, it's quite easy. I mean, it's just compile things, uh, build it, and then store the jar file and uh, deploy it to our test environment. And then when we want to de deploy to production, we take whatever we have in Artifactory and uh, deploy that one to our other environments that we have. So this one is, I mean, quite close to what we heard in the previous presentation uh, in much more detail there. So I won't go into the detail steps here, but th this part is quite nice to have. Um, and the reason for doing that is that we're on on-premise uh, GitHub at the moment. So the second thing we wanted to do uh, was infrastructure as code. How many of you have worked with infrastructure as code? Oh, good, more than half. So what we are doing, we define the environments in configuration file that we store in Git. Um, is this one point of truth that uh, it's there? Um, we know what it is. Uh, we also reduce the risk of having it to work on some machines, but not all. Uh, so we have it configured uh, there, and then we deploy that to production environment. And something that is called Git Ops uh, is basically just you take what's in, when we merge something to master in Git, you apply that to some environments. And what we did at the beginning was just uh, the test environment. Once that was in place, we uh, did it to production environments as well. And the last thing here is quite important. Because um, when I came into the project, uh, they had for some reason, reuse the same Google Cloud project for three different products um, and trying to sort out the access rights. Why is this uh, service account here? What does this do? What is, I mean, so no. Uh, so we th scrapped that and set up new projects instead. Uh, it was much easier to start from scratch. And then also lock down the access right of team members. Uh, we need to have some because everything is not automated from the start. Uh, we want to remove the manual rights uh, as we go along, but we want also to have something in production. Uh, but in production, uh, we just have two members with uh, rights to do things there, and that is um, more in case of emergency. We don't uh, do any changes there. But the rest of the team has no access apart from viewer access. Of course, you need to see what has gone wrong. You need to see logs or see what is the configuration if, if things don't work. But you should not be able to modify anything there. So that's quite important. Otherwise, you quite soon end up in the situation where people just do a little tweak here, a little bit tweak there, and suddenly you have these resources that are costing money. Uh, and it might work in the test environment because someone fixed something there, but not in the production environment. So we use Terraform. How many use, have used Terraform? A bit less than previous one. Uh, it's configuration for infrastructure uh, that we use it for. And it works with uh, many different providers. Uh, Google Cloud is what we're using it right now, but also on any other cloud provider and many other things as well. What some people think this is an abstraction layer, but it does depend very much on the on the API that is below it. Uh, so if it's Terraform on GCP, it's something different from AWS. They're similar, but you need to know the differences in your uh, on the cloud provider that you're using. Um, for example, if you set up a virtual machine, the machine types are, have different names, so you need to use the right ones. And sometimes the command have slightly other um, things you need to know about them as well. Um, the advantage is if you have multiple clouds, there's some knowledge that you can share between these uh, ones. So it's some competence uh, that you can reuse, but the scripts cannot be reused. And what I like about uh, Terraform is that it's declarative, is that you say uh, how the configuration should be. For example, I want a database with these properties. Uh, we have database version is that one. Uh, the name is something I would take as a variable as in parameter. What kind of uh, VM that sh it should be running on. Uh, but it does not describe how to create it. Um, 
is not create a database uh, because if you have the create a database script, then you need to uh, build the modify database script if you change something or delete it. So, but in Terraform, you just say, this is how things should look. And then Terraform uh, needs to sort out how do I go from uh, this description, what commands do I need to run to get there? And that is Terraform's job, it's not ours. Uh, so that's powerful. Um, so you never need to modify the scripts depending on, well, what if it's already running? What if something else is there? Uh, so that becomes much easier. So then what you can do is three basic things. One is Terraform plan. You ask Terraform, if I run this, what will happen? And it will tell you uh, what it think it will do. And if you're happy with that, you say, apply. Uh, this looks nice. Uh, I'll apply it. Uh, and then you can also destroy things. So if you set up a temporary environment, uh, Terraform can put that in place for you. And then you can destroy it, and all those resources will be removed, which is nice from uh, GCP perspective. You don't want to pay, thing, pay money for things you're no longer using. If you want to set up a temporary environment, it should be uh, possible to remove it uh, as easily as you created it. But there are some things that uh, I think you should look out for if you start going down the Terraform paths. Is that you really need to know the underlying uh, technology, and it's a bit sometimes a bit too easy to think that oh, this is easy to script, uh, mm -hmm. but it might be a bit more difficult than that. Um, so for you can easily rename the database. Um, that is like you just change the name and you run the Terraform apply and, and automate that. But what it will do is delete the database because in GCP you cannot uh, rename a uh, if you have a Postgres database you cannot rename it. So it will delete it and put up a new one. And if you do this in production, uh, your data is gone. So be careful. Um, test this out quite well. The risk with automation is that it will really do what you told it to do. Um, so you need to test these things uh, first. There are other things that cannot be deleted. Um, if you have KMS keys uh, or key rings, if they're created, they are always there. You cannot get them out of your project. They're permanent, um, so they cannot be deleted. There are also some things, names can be reserved. Uh, so if you created a database and delete it, you want to create the same one again, you, you're not able to do that. If it's uh, these Postgres databases, it's, that name is reserved for seven days. So you need to go in the documentation and be a bit careful with things you do there. It's, I mean, if you have the GCP knowledge as a base, it's the same things here. Uh, but if you're new to it, um, you need to look out because Terraform hides it a bit. It, um, if you use the UI, uh, you might get some warnings uh, on the way. And last one is first when you try to apply that you find out that it really works. So it says plan, I will do this, all this for you. and the Press, oh, nice, apply. And then it tells you, well, we don't have a machine type that is called that. Um, so you, you deleted the old one and the new machine type that it tried to, because you misspelled it or something. Uh, and plan doesn't sort that out for you. So it's quite a big difference between what plan says and what apply actually does in some cases. Uh, and it doesn't have all these quality checks in place. Uh, so we've had many cases where we, uh, have things, we review it, everything looks good, we apply it, and it doesn't work. So then you need to bug fix that some way. So what we did also on both the uh, infrastructure as code uh, and the build is that uh, we had the whole team to work on it. Uh, DevOps should not be a single person in the team that does all this. Uh, you can, of course, have a person that knows a bit more and is an expert on it but is, is really important that the whole team knows this. Because when you deploy to production um, and it doesn't work, and the person who set this up is well away on vacation or left the company, you need the whole team to have this knowledge. Uh, so we spent most of our first sprint having the whole team do Terraform scripts, uh, cloud build things uh, to get that knowledge in place. Uh, so that's an important learning that you, you really need the whole team to, to understand these things. Um, otherwise, you end up in a 
single point of failure that uh, when the, these fails, because I mean, the scripts do fail as well, um, especially when it's something critical you want to do, then it's important that as many people in the team as possible uh, know how these uh, things are working and are able to fix it. So that was what we did in the first two weeks. We got all the things in place. We deployed to production. Um, <clears throat> only thing was one of the features didn't really work. So <clears throat> we weren't able to tell our consumers that it did work. Uh, it was a bug in the feature set, but everything on the DevOps side was in place. So um, we had to spend some more time getting, uh, getting the feature things in place. Uh, but I think it was a success in the way that uh, we got the whole team to get into this area uh, and we got all this automation up and running. Uh, so that was a good start. Then where do you go from there? I, I mean, getting infrastructure and auto build automation is quite a good start. Uh, getting build or infrastructure as code in place when you already have something up and running is a bit more difficult. You can do that as well. Um, but if you're not really sure if these are the first steps for you, one thing is get input from the team. Uh, try to find time-consuming, time boring, repetitive tasks and automate those. Everything that is like feels, I don't want to do this again, this, that is something that is a good task to automate. If you have retrospectives either in Scrum or whatever development model you're using, that is also a good place. Uh, you hear people say, well, the, I think the build time is too slow. So that was something we added in a sprint later. Well, decrease build times. Uh, so you find these things uh, when you talk uh, to our team members. But if you run out of ideas, we uh, sit down with your team uh, and or want to do something a bit more uh, methodic, you can look at the DevOps report. And they have this wonderful diagram. Um, <clears throat> it's the book, uh, the Accelerate book. So they have from all things, if you change this, it will influence that and, and so on. Uh, and there are some things here that are really, it's difficult to see from some distance, but some things I really want to highlight. And it's, if you do some of these things, continuous delivery, you reduce the number of burn, or amount of burnout in the team, decrease development pain, decrease rework. Uh, you can increase job satisfaction and climate for learning. So there are a lot of things that really help the development team and makes life better. Uh, but it's, I mean, as it is, it's a bit too much. Uh, reading the book also has a lot of more details on each and every one of these things, uh, but it still might be a bit difficult to know uh, what is the next thing that we should do. So what we're using, uh, or just started to use, is a capabil DevOps <coughs> capability improvement framework uh, that is designed for self-assessment and what you want to achieve for some period, and that is something you can set yourself. So it's based on that Accelerate book uh, with a lot of evidence what is really working. And also what Adidas has done, they set up a DevOps maturity framework that we initially just used straight off and then it's, we've adapted this into internal version, is uh, document this in a way that it becomes a little bit easier to work with. Uh, so they, um, in the Accelerate book, they have used version control for all production artifacts um, and what Adidas added, they added a crawl, walk, run. Of course, that's be sports related. So, but it, we think this is quite a good uh, way of having different levels of what you want to achieve. So no version of control in place. Hope you're not there. Source code under version control. I know that many teams are here. But then apart from that, do you have all configuration files in version control? I think not all. Uh, are all your artifacts stored in some repository? Probably not. Uh, or if you're there, then you're fine on that one. And you go on to the next. How do you automate your deployment process? And so on. So you go through these steps, uh, and uh, it's based on these 24 capabilities. Adidas, they remove some, some are on a higher organizational level. Uh, if you work on that level, you can use those as well. Uh, but if it's in the development team, those can be ignored as uh, getting management structures and so on. Uh, set up uh, that's a bit more high level. Um, and then Adidas added some of their own that some are OK and some I'm not too happy about, but it works for their company. And that is important. You need to get something that fits your organization. So I took the 
Adidas one and the book and uh, started make one for uh, how we work internally. Rewrote some of the text, um, re-added something they removed from the book, um, added something that uh, we thought was good internally. This one is, uh, the Adidas one is public. Uh, there's a link here, uh, the Adidas Development Maturity Framework. Um, if you search on it, you can find it on uh, GitHub. Uh, the IKEA one is not public, so I, I'm not sure in that one uh, at the moment. Uh, but it's a good way because n not only you find out where you are in uh, on your level, but it's a good discussion with the whole team. Uh, some of these things people know that we should do this. Uh, some other things is, oh, is, that sounds good. Should we do that? Uh, I mean, with one of the other teams I worked with, that we had a long discussion on what kind of security scanning is needed if you use Go as a language. What vulnerabilities, what tools are there? Uh, so we had a long discussion into that little detail, uh, which is important for them. So they realized, oh, here's something we need to work with. Uh, but it's good because you go through a lot of different areas and as a team, then the next thing is the team decides. It's not me and my DevOps uh, role that goes in and say, well, this team should do this and that. It's, it's up to the team. So it's the responsibility of the model. Everything is team responsibility. They can decide what to do. If you think that, no, we don't need this one. Uh, we don't want whatever is on the run capability on this one. Well, ignore it. Um, but then you've had a discussion in the team. You've made a decision that for in our environment, this doesn't make sense or it's too expensive or time consuming. Uh, and this might be just where we would like to be. Um, but it worked really good as a discussion um, starter and, and get the ideas rolling in the team. And further resources. Uh, there are two books I would like to re recommend. Uh, one is Accelerate, uh, and half of it is really good. It's, uh, I mean, what you should do to uh, have less rework, uh, happier developers. Um, it's a re good reading for anybody who's working with software development. And then this one, Phoenix Project. Has anyone read it? It's a, a fiction book, uh, but uh, with DevOps in mind. It's a story of a company that is doing really bad and what they're doing to improve things. Uh, so it's uh, well, one of the authors of this one is the same who was in there. Uh, so it's quite tied together. But it's a fiction uh, story, really exciting about uh, code fa or deployment failures and uh, emergency situations. Uh, sounds silly when you say it, but it's really good. The, there's a follow-up uh, book to that one that will be released tomorrow. So I haven't read that one yet, uh, but I guess it will be good as well. So. Those two are, two are good to read. Uh, this one gives a, I mean, also a good thing, uh, understanding uh, how things can get improved in your teams. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat>